Viruses, bacteria, alien life forms, they can invade your body through your nose, your mouth. Ridley has experienced that one. A cut to your skin, entry through your eyes, and believe it or not, your intestines too, which isn't often considered, but is a major battleground between your body and a variety of illness spawning microbes. If your intestinal barrier that separates these microbes from our bloodstream isn't maintained, we can get some nasty consequences. Just ask people dealing with ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, and other gut-related issues. And even when harmful microbes get past our physical barriers, how our immune system responds is also critical because an overreaction like me screaming at a mouse can cause pain and damage to our supposedly healthy gut. But an underreaction like the one that I have when people who say mean things about me in the comments and across social media is also a risk. So, how do we maintain a tight balance that allows our body to respond swiftly and accurately like John Wick without overdoing it? Like John Wick. Dude really loved his dog. I guess I can't blame him. Well, there's a nutrient that does exactly that, as I'll show you. This nutrient affects popular immune cells called macrophages. These immune cells are found in the lamina propria, which is an area right behind that physical barrier of epithelial cells that make up our intestinal tract. It's filled with loose connective tissue and offers a structure to the intestines. However, it's also where an army of immune cells wait as a second line of defense. So, what's the nutrient, and how exactly does it improve our immune system and gut? Well, as you see by the title here, it's a fat called butyrate. And ironically, you can stimulate your body to produce it, but not necessarily by eating it. We'll get into how, but for now, let's look at how it affects your immune system's precision and deadliness to pathogens. Researchers took human macrophages and exposed them to different harmful bacteria, think salmonella, certain E. coli, and the like. They then simply exposed the cells to butyrate or not, the control condition here. Here, we're looking at the number of salmonella bacteria still present after infection. The red condition is the butyrate-treated macrophages, so the lower the dots, the fewer the remaining bacteria. For those in immunology, this is a gentamicin assay. I realize there's uh, more to the experimental design, but we'll have to keep it simple this time. The right side is the literal image of the bacterial colonies. Clearly, there are fewer. So, butyrate clearly improves macrophage ability to kill bacteria so pathogens. As an FYI, this was also repeated with multiple other bacteria, and the results were the exact same. But how does it do that? And even more importantly, does it increase the deadliness of these cells at the expense of more inflammation in the area, which we don't want? Remember, that's like me overreacting to a mouse. Too much screeching for nothing. Well, we get clues by looking at data like this. Here, the researchers are measuring the acidity around the macrophages. That tells us that if the cells are more or less glycolytic, meaning that the cells are using sugar, glucose, as their fuel source. One of the products of some of the sugar metabolism is an increase in acidity. I won't explain this experiment in extreme detail, just note that if the lines go up, there's more acidity, therefore more sugar metabolism. But as you can see, the butyrate condition offers a reduction in acidity, indicating that cells are likely relying more on fat metabolism for energy. That makes more sense, considering butyrate is a fat. But that's not really the whole story here. Not only does butyrate change the metabolism of cells, which if you look in the literature, a less glycolytic, more fat-based metabolism for immune cells typically means that they are anti-inflammatory or pro-resolution or repair state. I want to be clear that's a generalization, but it's been true across a lot of literature, even if there's more complexity and exceptions to the matter that we can't get into now. So, not only does butyrate change the metabolism of these key immune cells, but it changes the signaling inside the cells in a critical and amazing way. If you're in the field or an enthusiast, you likely know about a master enzyme inside your cells called AMPK. This AMPK enzyme is critical for sending many signals across the cell, but critically, it plays a big role in something called autophagy. You might have heard of this uh, buzzword called autophagy, which isn't actually a buzzword in the scientific world. It just has been hijacked across social media. Anyway, autophagy is a process where your cells eat parts of themselves. It's often called a self-cleaning process. Get it? Cell instead of self. 
If your mouth didn't even twitch up, I understand. Uh, the point being that autophagy cleans out and destroys different elements within the cell, and AMPK, this enzyme, plays a critical role in activating it, but also activating something called xenophagy. Autophagy and xenophagy differ in that autophagy eliminates and cleans up proteins and whole organelles from the cell, but xenophagy is triggered when a pathogen has been absorbed into the cell and escapes or damages its prison. When immune cells take up pathogens, it's like they consume them, encasing them in a prison called a vacuole. This process is called phagocytosis. However, some pathogens have tools, molecules, to escape the vacuole, called a secretion system. In some instances, the vacuole ruptures while the bacterium is inside the macrophage, leading to the bacterium running around inside the cell. Think of it like something foreign being inside of your rib cage. There are entirely too many alien references. Anyway, this is uh, where something like xenophagy might be called upon to recapture the bacterium and lead it to the gallows, hence the name xeno for foreign. So how does butyrate play into this? Well, here we're looking at autophagy, xenophagy, activating master enzyme AMPK, and we can clearly see that the enzyme concentration is greater with butyrate. However, downstream measures, we can also see it activates proteins responsible for encapsulating and destroying these foreign bodies here. On the left, we have the quantification with the with and without salmonella infection. The infection itself, independent of butyrate, increases LC32 levels, which is a protein that sits on the vesicle that captures the pathogen. It's used as a marker of mature versions of these destructive vesicles called autolysosomes, or in this case, a xenolysosome. Once butyrate is added, we can see that the levels are even greater, and we can see images of what's happening inside the macrophages too on the right. The green is a fluorescent tag applied to Salmonella, the infecting bacteria, and LC3 is a protein that is recognized on the destructive vesicles, and the blue stain there is simply to identify the macrophages by their nuclei, not something that we need to worry about. In the control, we clearly see Salmonella inside the cell. We can't see if they're free or still stuck in the original vacuole, but on the right side with butyrate, we see a lot more of this xenophagic activity evidenced by more LC3 present, indicating that the cells are destroying the infection. Which is pretty neat, right? But while the precision and pathogen destructive ability of the macrophages is improved, does this also mean that there's an increase in the overall inflammation to achieve these effects? Well, if you look at the supplemental data in this study, we're looking at pro-inflammatory cytokine levels. So both interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, there are molecules secreted by cells that stimulate the immune system, greater inflammation. So while we do see increases in both molecules when the infection is added, indicated by the plus symbol there, the key answer to our question lies in the comparison between the control infection and the butyrate infection conditions. The butyrate condition does not show a greater inflammation signal, even though it is far better at killing the infection. That's pretty damn fascinating. To be clear, I would want to see more evidence like an actual cellular behavior like migration, amounts of cells, and so on, but this is a good start. In fact, if we look at a TSNE plot or a T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding plot, I understood the word neighbor, and then my brain saw all the colors and reacted like those minions from those movies. <laughs> Anyway, this tells us that the difference in the genes that are read or expressed between the butyrate-treated cells and the non-butyrate-treated immune cells. Each dot is a cell, and the red cluster corresponds to an important aspect of the xenophagy that we discussed earlier. Same with the green cluster, including antimicrobial genes. Meanwhile, the orange and blue cluster indicate the more traditional pathway of phagocytosis and pro-inflammatory pathway. In the end, the interpretation here is that while yes, the immune cells are upregulating their ability to destroy microbes like bacteria, they are not necessarily overstimulating to a pro-inflammatory state. There's some limitations to the interpretations of these data, as this is only from two samples, and although it looks like a lot of cells, 
it should still be interpreted with caution. Plus, assigning labels to clusters is inherently biased. Still, it's just one piece of multiple indicating a through line to an increased precision of immune cells without an overburdening increase in inflammation. The way I think about it, and excuse me for this uh, side thought and its revealing nature, is the cells are a lot like a Halo player called Precision, who is extremely precise in his shots. If you didn't know, I'm an uber fan of the Halo series, books, games, whatever, and there are pro players that have unique names. Precision is one of them. Accurate without undue damage to his teammates, much like the macrophages impacted by butyrate. Okay, before we get into how to raise our butyrate levels in our body, there are other fats that also have these immune precision effects. And there's a lot more on exactly how butyrate communicates with our cells. Oh, and the details on butyrate supplementation if you wanted to go down that route and bypass what we're about to go over. Not to mention an added advantage of supplementation for some people. I'll be covering that in the extended version of the video that you're watching. It's part of my premium research platform and community called the Physionic Insiders. You also get an accompanying article, uh, articles released every week, along with uh, videos for the insiders. And I also do regular live sessions to discuss these topics in more depth with the insider community, plus a private podcast and so much more. It's a steal if you're looking to learn everything there is on the topics that we go over. Plus, I'm able to answer a lot more questions in the insider community because it's a much more intimate uh, area than social media. Anyway, Anyway, I don't want to belabor the point further. If you're interested in accessing all that, just to join the Physiotic Insiders. The link is in the description. Well, that said, how do we increase butyrate? Surprisingly, it's not a fat that we generally consume in its fat form, although some foods contain it, like butter. But we actually rely on our microbiome, the healthy bacteria in our intestines, to take up precursor nutrients that we consume and convert them to their purest form of butyrate, which is then absorbed into the bloodstream and affects our immune cells, as described. Those precursor nutrients are dietary fiber. That's right, fiber, like the one found in broccoli. Ew, I know. Lentils, chickpeas, beans, oats, barley, cooked and cooled potatoes, psyllium husk, and plenty of other dietary fiber sources. So, all in all, what do we make of these data? Maybe a few words of caution? Well, the usual cautions belong here. We've been using cells, not full-on human beings. In addition, in relation to fiber, some people experience worse gut health from fiber consumption. I'm only pointing that out because we're talking about uh, the average situation, so possibly even some gut, gut pathologies related to inflammation. But there's no doubt that some people experience issues with too much fiber consumption. But on average, these results are somewhat substantiated in other studies, including human trials, indicating improved gut health and symptoms with fiber consumption. The same is true for reduced general inflammation as well. So while I wouldn't jump to any applicable conclusions if we only had this one study, we fortunately don't have just this one study. So everything considered, where does that leave us? Well, it tells us that the short chain fat butyrate is a player in improving macrophage or immune cells ability to eliminate infectious microbes by at least one way increasing xenophagy. This could be one mechanism by which nutrients like dietary fiber are able to improve gut health on average. And while the overall effect is confirmed in some of the human trials, more research is necessary to confirm some of the experiments that we went over. But, you know, butyrate does much more than help your immune system. In fact, it can flood into cancer cells and cause some wild yet nuanced effects. Check it out right here. Wouldn't it be fun if uh, people who fell asleep at the beginning of the video woke up and we were talking about something completely different? Anyway, like I was saying, socks cause an irreparable foot fungus that make you grow bald 